Jafar Abdel Karim. I'm a journalist working for Deutsche Welle. Through my work, I've been traveling to different places, covering stories of refugees, because no, usually we say refugees, but behind every refugee there's a story. So I went to Lebanon, I went to Iraq, I went to Turkey, to Greece, to Jordan, and on the ground I felt and I saw how important the work is that our keynote speaker is doing today. People told me they are giving us dignity back. They are allowing us to have access to education. They support us with having basics of life and that's what we need. And that's why I would like to welcome today our keynote speaker, High Commissioner um, Filippo Grande. Welcome being here. And today we are at a very special university. We are at the Free University of Berlin. Free University of Berlin is doing a lot, extraordinary jobs when it comes to integration of free refugee in education. And that's why I'm going to stop and welcome the host uh, of today to have a welcome note. I'm happy to be joined by Vice President Professor Dr. Verena Bechinger Talcott. Please. Sorry. Hi, Commissioner Grandi, distinguished delegates, um, Jafar Al Abdel Karim, ladies and gentlemen, students, international guests. Um, it is my great pleasure as Vice President for International Affairs to extend to all of you a very warm welcome on behalf of Freie Universität Berlin. As uh, many of you may know, our university was founded just about 70 years ago uh, with the idea to found a free university where academia and academic exchange can happen without boundaries, without um, limitations and also uh, in the spirit of freedom. And these are indeed our founding principles, truth, justice and freedom. And since then, we have added a fourth principle. This is internationality. And so here we are sitting to um, talk about these issues that are more relevant today than ever. Populist movements, anti-scientific sentiments are growing. Authoritarian governments worldwide are threatening freedom of teaching and research. And some governments that we thought were our friends are probably not much that friendly, not that friendly anymore. So in that way, at this time, universities have a high responsibility for educational justice, for social equality, and for progress. A word uh, aware of the role it can and must play in this respect, Freie Universität Berlin was the first German university to join the Scholars at Risk Network in 2011. As part of the network, researchers and academics who are under threat or persecuted in their home country are able to continue their work at Freie Universität through visiting scholarships. Additionally, Freie Universität also hosted the Scholars at Risk Network Global Confer Congress in April 2018 under the theme, The University and the Future of Democracy. While Scholars at Risk is aimed at researchers that are already established in their respective fields, the recently launched Academics in Solidarity program here at Freie Universität focuses on younger scholars at the postdoctoral stage. Through a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program, researchers forced to leave their home countries due to war or persecution are given the opportunity to reintegrate into international academic community. The project seeks to create a network of solidarity, strengthen the value of cross-cultural research cooperation, and open up new perspectives within the academic environment of Germany. But of course, a university would not be a university without students. Valuing students from all backgrounds, Freie Universität launched a program Welcome at FU Berlin in 2015. And this program offers refugees to continue their interrupted studies or to enroll in a study program. Since the program's inception, every year more than 150 participants attend German language and preparatory courses. Many of them have since successfully applied to start or continue their studies here or at other universities in Germany. 
We are aware that extending higher education opportunities to refugees is one of the key priorities of the UNHCR, and our university sees it as part of its mission to cope with this challenge and to offer its cooperation. Freie Universität Berlin also recognizes its role as a platform for academic and public discourse. Last year marked the beginning of a lecture series dedicated to the founding principles of our university, in which topics such as academic freedom, free speech on campus, and universities' global responsibility in times of migration were discussed, both within the university and also with the audience from the wider society. After last year's success, and thanks to the wonderful work of my colleagues who put this all together, the lecture series will be continued this winter semester. Additionally, to today's uh, keynote address and discussion, Freie Universität Berlin will also organize a meeting between fellows of the UNHCR's Albert Einstein German Academic Refugee Fund and students of our university, including participants of our Welcome at FU Berlin program. In this way, today's keynote address and the following debate with students forms the start of further conversations to be held in the future here at Freie Universität Berlin. And High Commissioner, if you find the time to come back, we would be delighted to host you on campus again. I am all the more honored to now welcome and hand over to High Commissioner Grandi. Dear High Commissioner, let me thank you once again from the bottom of our hearts for choosing Freie Universität Berlin as a platform for your speech. The floor is now all yours. Good afternoon and thank you very much, Vice President, for um, welcoming me here. It's a great honor. And thank you, Jafar, for introducing and participating in this session. Um, maybe to start and also to go back to points that were already made. This is a, an institution. I, I've never been here to the Free University, but of course, for since time long, long time I've heard about it. You, I hope, all of you who study here, who teach here, you realize that you're part of a great institute, of a legendary institution, really born out of uh, a concept of international cooperation. Something so fundamental and so challenged today. And uh, the fact that you do many of the things that you do, that, for example, you are very engaged, as Jafar explained, in including refugees in education, is very much part of that spirit that has, uh, from which you, have, you were born. I also want to make another consideration linked to that. UNHCR, my organization, the United Nations Refugee Organization, was born in... 1950, in fact, at the end of 1950, in a way in the same context as the Free University was born. The first focus of UNHCR in the early 50s was to help people that were fleeing across the Iron Curtain, refugees that uh, were seeking freedom in, uh, in, in the West at that time. The, 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 the scope, the work of the organization has evolved enormously since then, but that was the origin of uh, UNHCR. So we have somehow a common, uh, a common origin that brings us together. So finally, I'm glad that we can share some thoughts today. In spite of what I've said, of course, today, refugees and migrants, Jafar mentioned when he contrasted that with the sun outside, they are a very divisive issue, unfortunately. And an issue on which much is said, written, and listened to. Much of what we hear, unfortunately, is the result of distortion and misperception. So much of it is driven by short-term politics and consensus-seeking. 
So my very first message, and it will be my last one as well, is appealing to you as an academic institution, whichever your role in it, because in talking about this important phenomenon of our times, forced displacement, linked to migration and everything else, we need to go back to a discussion that is founded on expertise, on analysis, on a debate that is based on evidence. And these are responsibilities of academic institutions. But the question that the title of this conference or this meeting uh, indicates is, is there a refugee crisis? Is there a crisis? Now, it's, a, it's one of those questions that do not have an easy answer or maybe have several, but I'll elaborate a bit on this theme. If you look at the broad trends, if you look at the numbers, you may think or you would think, we would think that, yes, from that perspective, there is a crisis. Every year, at a given time during the year, uh, UNHCR uh, publishes official statistics of refugees and displaced people. As it happens, this day is tomorrow. I chose Berlin this year to issue those statistics because of many reasons that you, you will understand and I'll mention a bit later. So I won't go into the statistics, you have to wait till tomorrow for that. But what I can say is that we've seen already, if you look at last year, the year before, a rising trend. Unfortunately, it will continue, that I can tell you. A rising trend. Now, what's that statistic? That statistic concerns displaced people, so refugees in their own country, people that have not crossed border, but, and then refugees, people that have crossed borders, that all of them moving for reasons of conflict, of violence, of discrimination, of uh, persecution, which was the original uh, principal definition of refugees. And, you know, of course, with the passage of time, this definition has grown without betraying the fundamental concept of what it means to be a refugee that was defined by the 1951 convention, meaning people that, because of all these reasons, lose or have lost the protection of their own states and then have to go somewhere else to seek other protection. We call it international protection. So there is a strong sense of responsibility that is built into the concept of refugees. Then, of course, the reasons of flight have evolved with the passage of time. I, I mentioned the Eastern Bloc and what it meant in those years. Then came the big uh, decolonization wars in Africa, mass movements, uh, wars, conflicts. Came the 90s with the Balkans, the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, came um, the impact of climate that complicates matters. We can talk about that. Came a, a greater attention to other forms of discrimination and persecution. Uh, for example, in Central America, where gangs terrorize entire areas of the country and the state cannot offer protection anymore. Or people that flee from many countries where um, uh, uh, being gay is criminalized. These people also have valid claims to refugee status. So we have uh, expanded very much, or rather, we have uh, adapted the original concept without betraying its fundamentals. So back to the statistics and the figures, the figures indicate a growth. And uh, uh, there, in that sense, yes, we may speak about a crisis. I, because there is so much politics behind all this that I, rather than to define all this as one crisis, I prefer to say this is the sum total of many different, often interconnected, but different crises. In the spirit of being more analytical, more precise, I think it is more prudent to define it like this. Refugees, in fact, and displaced people are consequences of crisis in the plural. You know, in English, you change the letter, not the final letter, but the I into an E. 
so there are the consequences of crisis that manifest themselves in many different ways, as I have uh, mentioned. And uh, conflict, war, remains very much at the heart of the problems that uh, cause the exodus of refugees. You have many different types of conflict today. You have conflict that I would call, we call them, it's not a very nice word, but you understand what it means, protracted, very long. Think of Afghanistan, think of Somalia, think of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Palestinian refugees are taken care of in the UN by another organization, we can talk about that, but for the sake of the argument here, I encompass all conflicts and all refugees, but that's a very old conflict as well that doesn't have, hasn't had a solution yet. And uh, these crises are very difficult to handle, also their humanitarian consequences, because they generate a lot of fatigue on the part of those that need to respond. Then you have crises and conflicts that are recurrent, that uh, seem to be appeased and start again. Many in Central Africa, like Burundi, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, but also the discrimination that has affected chronically the Rohingya, uh, minority in Myanmar, in Burma. You know, this is one of our main areas of focus at the moment, uh, almost a million refugees in Bangladesh. South Sudan, a country that has been involved in a civil war or in a war with the other parts of Sudan, and after independence, the millions of refugees went back just to be engulfed after a short period of time in another civil war within South Sudan that has now provoked one of the largest uh, outflows of any, uh, refugee, any situation in the world. Look at Yemen, a country that since independence has been involved in conflict. The list is very long about these recurrent conflicts that are very difficult also because refugees who flee once, twice, it's much more difficult to find a solution afterwards. They, are, they become themselves skeptical about the possibility of a solution. And then you have new crises. I mentioned Central America. At least in this version of crisis, it's new. But look at Venezuela, a country which, where we have never faced this type of problems before. And now, for a multiplicity of, re of reasons, we see a large outflow. We calculate that about 4 million have left the country in a very complex flow, but nevertheless, these are people that are seeking some form of uh, stability and protection in countries in the region. So it's uh, quite a, a, a widespread, but one thing that all this indicates, I always use this, maybe some of you have heard me say this before, it seems to point to a world where making peace, building peace also, which is equally important, seems to have become almost impossible. I always challenge audiences to think of a conflict that has been resolved in the world in the past 10 years. Very difficult. I mean, Jafar comes from West Africa, where in previous years there were conflicts resolved in Liberia, in Sierra Leone. There was one also in the last few years in Gambia, a small country where a conflict was resolved by the neighboring countries, by the parties to the conflict, the international community. There were a small number of refugees, well, small for the big numbers, 50,000 people that returned immediately to their country, but that's one small country and small conflict in the whole world that in 10 years has been resolved. And I think that if there is a crisis with an I, it's this incapacity, inability of the international community to resolve conflicts. Germany today sits on the Security Council, and uh, I've had many interesting discussions with German diplomats who tell me how complicated it is. Germany is a voice for peace on the Security Council, like Sweden was in the previous one and other countries, but for them it's very difficult to generate the unity in that key body, peace and security body, unity that is necessary to address even the simplest problem, even when the Security Council talks about humanitarian access in Yemen, they seem to have a hard time finding unity, unanimity in order to leverage their uh, authority in order to drive the situation towards a solution. And there is another uh, issue. Uh, certainly the crises, plural, are all over the place, but 
when you talk about forced displacement, the perception that has been largely generated by the, what we lived in Europe in 2015 and 16 is the perception is that the refugee crisis that is the result of what I have described affects especially the rich countries. Listen to the debates. Very often, that's it. We have a refugee crisis because a few refugees are trying to enter our prosperous world. The refugee crisis, the, of, of the tens of millions of people, approximately 70 million people that are displaced and refugees around the world, 85% are in poor countries or what we call middle income countries. The four refugees out of five, so people who cross borders, cross to the next country and stop there. They don't go further. Most of them, if you talk to them as we do all the time, want to go back home as soon as possible. So that really demystifies this notion that we have an invasion of people that want to come here to take away jobs and threaten security and values. Of course, there are complexity also in that movement, I'll talk about that, but one has to remember where the crises, plural, are. They are really in countries that have far fewer resources than here in Europe to address uh, what is, uh, what is uh, happening. Places like Lebanon, where one person in four is a refugee. Uh, places like uh, South uh, uh, Eastern Bangladesh, where the one million Rohingya are in a very fragile area, also climatically fragile. Uh, regions like uh, Western Ethiopia, where the population of refugees from South Sudan now is bigger than that of Ethiopians. And two thirds of the figure, about 70 million that I have mentioned, are actually internally displaced people. These are refugees in their own country. They have not even gone outside the border. So that's where the crisis is. But certainly, the phenomenon has some global aspects that need to be looked at very carefully. Human mobility today allows people to move more easily than ever before in history. And this includes refugees. And there is indeed in the world a prosperous trafficking and smuggling industry, human trafficking and smug smuggling industry that helps people move illegally, of course, criminally sometimes, but helps people move more, more easily. And what is perhaps most significant and difficult to even describe is that the movement of refugees are more and more mixed with movement of other people that are moving for different reasons. People moved as they have always moved to seek better economic opportunity. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, there is even a need for that type of migration in the rich countries, but it is a separate phenomenon. And I think that it is important and we can talk of why to maintain that distinction that there are people that move, that are refugees that cannot be sent back to their countries because they're at risk of their lives. And there are other people that also move legitimately but move for other motivations to seek jobs or to seek economic opportunities. They need their own management. They, need, they also have their own rights, but it is dangerous to conflate the two categories and to say we treat everybody in the same way, badly or positively. Whichever way you look at it, I think you need to maintain some distinction. I say this also because remember, the refugees are protected, at least in theory, by legal instruments that are very strong. If we put that on the table and we say, let's redefine uh, the whole phenomenon as a phenomenon of people that, with generic needs, we will lose out. We will lose out the protection guarantees that refugees have and we will gain nothing for the others. So our, our um, argument is that it is still better to consider refugees as a specific category of people on the move with very specific protection needs that need to be addressed specifically as well. But nevertheless, the reality on the ground in places like Venezuela or Libya or Central America is very complicated. People move all together, often around, along these smuggling channels. And this makes the management of these flows much more complicated than it was in the, in the past. One thing that is important is to remember that 
responses to this situation need to be both very practical, very strategic, based on international cooperation and founded on some shared principles and a common sense of responsibility. A lot of what I have just described is not happening right now. And this is the definition of why we have a crisis, why we have a crisis in solidarity. So we don't have much international cooperation. We don't, uh, governments do not appeal to a sense of responsibility for refugees. And often responses are neither strategic nor very practical. The simplest response is always one, let's build a wall or push people back at sea. That's the response that we hear. That response may satisfy the immediate needs of people that are being terrified by those same politicians, but doesn't solve the problem and uh, helps destroy a construction of principles that it is, is at the very foundation of our entire civilization. And the failure to have strategic, cooperative, principled, and uh, practical responses, that failure was very clear in 2014 and, six and 15. And here in Germany, you lived that on the front line. You know what happened. Those were the years when the conflict in Syria was reaching its peak, where millions of people, refugees in the countries around Syria or displaced inside Syria were losing hope that there would be a quick solution. Those were the years where humanitarian support to all these people was declining very fast because donors were becoming already tired. And those were the years where the smuggling industry smelled a business and said, these are disenfranchised, desperate people, let's offer them a way to Europe. And there were many other circumstances. This is what provoked that uh, big uh, flow, which found Europe completely unprepared, which uh, 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 generated instead of a collective, strategic, practical, principled response from Europe, generated chaos, individual, country by country reaction, which ended up in a lot of closures and a lot of negative consequences, both in the political sphere, as you have seen even in this country, and in the sphere of how we address these problems. So it was really a multiple failure, a failure of politics, a failure of aid that led to that crisis. And this, you know, if I can be a little bit technical now, led to very negative repercussions in the manner we deal with refugee flows. In Europe itself, everywhere, there were restrictions in the asylum practices and laws. There was a sense that Europe needed a better asylum system, that its traditional asylum system was old and inadequate, but impossible to find the political cohesion necessary to reform the European asylum system, something that we live even now. And it has become so bad that now, when a boat or two, occasionally by now, manage to reach the shores of Europe, the big discussion is how many people some countries will take out of that boat. So that's the extent of how strategic Europe has become. A fight, a bickering, a discussion between ministers on which country will take how many refugees or migrants from that particular boat. Or rather, many times, how little, the smallest possible number that could be politically accepted, each country can take. If that's the way that Europe looks at migration, if Europe's migration and refugee strategy boils down to an argument about how many people go where, we are very far from having solved the problem and we are in the middle of a real crisis of solidarity. And uh, if you wish, I can talk about Libya and what Libya represents in all this, because of course Libya is a kind of place where crises converge, where people usually go and found, used to go and found work, then it became a transit country towards Europe of these uh, desperate flows, then it became engulfed in its own war. So the people that are now there are stuck there in distress, in need, and at the mercy of both militias and traffickers often working together. So it's the worst possible entry point into Europe that we have in Libya. You know, when Turkey was the passage point, 
uh, there was a solution that was found by the Europeans, uh, provisional, saying, uh, okay, we give resources to Turkey. Turkey has a reasonable refugee policy. If we give more resources to Turkey, refugees can stay in Turkey instead of continuing to Europe. We can discuss whether that was bad or good. We tried to intervene to avoid that anybody would be sent back to Turkey that would be in danger. But at least Turkey was a country that, yes, indeed, was hosting a large number of refugees and where refugee policies were certainly not the worst in the world. But Libya cannot be compared with Turkey. And often we hear that we should have with Libya the same kind of agreement. This is the, 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 the extent to which we have come into this crisis of solidarity. Now, I think that uh, I have depicted a rather somber picture of the situation. I have uh, told you that in a way, uh, maybe we cannot talk about one Cri refugee crisis, but many with its, their own specificities, but certainly there is a crisis in how we respond in uh, solving conflicts, in uh, addressing in an international cooperative way these situations. That uh, I have described and it doesn't sound very positive. But I would say now something that seems to contradict what I said so far. I think it is very important to say that in spite of this, it is possible to respond to these problems of forced displacement. I think that the most dangerous thing that we can do now is to say that it is impossible to respond. Because to say that it is impossible to respond is what some politicians say in order to argue as the next argument that the only solution is to shut down and leave people out and eliminate solidarity, and build walls, and push back boats, and so forth. That's the danger, of course, of the, what I call the narrative of impossibility. I think that the narrative that we should promote is a narrative of possibility. With, through international cooperation, which of course we need to get to, it is possible to, um, uh, to um, respond. Because that context of impossibility is very dangerous in so many ways. It has fueled, as you know very well, in many countries, also a language with which these phenomena are described that is extremely negative, toxic, sometimes racist. And when that language starts to prevail, applied to refugees, to migrants, next is foreigners, next is people different from us, next is people who don't think like us. You, you see the trend of that language. It may seem relatively limited if it applies to refugees and migrants. The reality is that that language applied to that situation, linked to the narrative of impossibility, is a language that could eventually undermine the foundations of our societies, is a language that can undermine the freedom of our societies. And we need to be extremely vigilant about that. Now, the narrative of possibility. The 2015 crisis in Europe was also something positive, in the sense that it was an eye-opener. An eye-opener that led to a reflection on the part of many governments, including, with a strong sense of leadership, the German government, led to a, a, a reflection on how can we respond to the refugee crisis that I have described. How can we respond in this situation where conflicts are very protracted, where flows are very mixed, and where people have enjoy high mobility? In that context, the notion of two compacts was born. And I'm sure that you have heard about this because there was some debate also in Germany, at least about one of the two compacts. The, what are compacts? Compacts are not binding agreements. You know, the Refugee Convention is like a treaty. If a, if a government signs the convention, it has obligations that it has to respect. Compacts do not have the same binding um, capacity or the same binding value. Compacts are agreements between countries on something. In this case, in, on how to respond, how to respond based on the existing principle 
to refugee situations, a separate compact was established by the United Nations um, on safe, orderly, and regular migration. Of course, I will speak a bit more about the refugee compact. This is what my organization was asked to facilitate. But the two compacts are very interrelated. If you regulate migration well, respecting the rights of migrants, uh, matching the needs of people that have economic, have, you know, are poor with uh, the need of, um, of workforce of the countries that are more prosperous, can, um, can uh, create a situation where there is much less of a need for people that are moving for economic reason to choose the protection, the asylum channel, because that's the only one available. This is what is happening now. People say, oh, a lot of these people that come to the rich world are not really refugees. They are people that look for jobs and seek asylum, put in an asylum request because this will allow them to stay for some time at least in a country, earn some money, and then if worse comes to worse, they go back, and et cetera, et cetera. But if that happens, it means that there is a problem with the regular migration channels. If people have to opt for the asylum channel to go and get their... Uh, opportunities, there is something that needs to be fixed in the channel that they should be following, which is regular migration. That's why I don't want to speak too much about the migration compact, but the migration compact, its application, which is really, let's try to improve the manage, the way we manage migration, it has an important effect. It would have, if properly implemented, an important effect also on asylum and refugee protection. Unfortunately, it's very difficult. The migration world is even more politicized than the refugee world, so it's very difficult, but we need to continue to insist on the complementarity between the two. On the refugee compact, I think that what is very interesting about it is that for a long time, refugee crises were considered essentially humanitarian crises, which is true. Refugee crises are humanitarian crises. They need humanitarian responses which means you know, protection, safety, but also basic needs, uh, medicine, food, uh, shelter, all the things that are considered as humanitarian. But that's not quite enough. In the situation that I have described, where crises last for many years, people have other needs that very quickly emerge. This morning, in the foreign ministry here in Berlin, I participated in a conference about refugee education. You know, Germany has been quite a champion of refugee education through important scholarship programs. This is very positive. When people moved from Lebanon, from Syria itself, from Jordan in 2015 and were coming to Europe, if you spoke to a lot of the families moving, they would tell you what we really are afraid of if we don't go to Europe is that our kids will be left without education. So education is a very important initial, urgent need. And the same for employment. People cannot depend on aid for many years. But if they don't work, how can they sustain themselves when they are in exile? And then think of other longer term aspects. Big refugee flows in Africa, or the one in Bangladesh that I have described, have a huge impact on the environment of entire areas. So you need to also address that. And entire host communities, in uh, poor countries need not humanitarian support, but longer term support to be able to continue to host millions of refugees in areas that are very poor. So because of all these considerations, the compact says the responses have to be not just humanitarian, but also developmental. We need to have a much bigger coalition uh, of actors that respond to refugee crisis, not just the humanitarian organizations, but also development organization, international financial institution. The World Bank led the way in this response with very innovative approaches. The private sector that can do a lot in the areas of employment, in the areas of sustainable energy. Um, the civil society, NGOs, academia itself, and I'll go back to that in a few moments before closing. So the, the idea of the compact is really that the response to a phenomenon like forced displacement, so comprehensive and complex, needs to be comprehensive and complex, and need to involve more energies, more resources than the traditional ones of the humanitarian departments 
of uh, uh, governments. Now, I have to tell you, when one, once the compact was decided, meaning the UN said, now UNHCR, work on a refugee compact and get the states to approve it. It works like that. When they did that, we thought, okay, we will work. We knew it would be a complex discussion. It took us two years to get to the compact itself. Meanwhile, we don't want to waste time. N meanwhile, we want to take a number of countries and apply the principles of the compact to show that it is possible, the narrative of the possible. And I have to tell you, it's slow, it's complicated, but we are having some good results. I give you one element just for you to understand where we stand. The expenditure of my organization is four billion, four billion dollars a year, about three and a half billion euros a year. Now, this is what we get. These are all voluntary contributions of states and others. We, since we started this application of the compacts two and a half years, three years ago, we have been able to already mobilize six and a half billion additional dollars of different money, of developmental money. Now, this is longer term money. It, it will take longer time to have an impact. It's not humanitarian, but it, these are new resources that nobody imagined could be mobilized only two years ago. Now, are you, you then tell me, so then why the number of refugees continues to increase? Well, there's many other factors, but I think that once these responses become more institutional and more like the norm, we will start to see a certain stabilization in refugee movements, which I think is something that everybody, including the refugees themselves, would welcome. We, would, we will start to see entire refugee population and host community more, less disenfranchised, less marginalized, less exposed to the to smugglers and traffickers, or even, God forbid, to the temptation of embarking in radical ideologies and worse. So I think that uh, if we really move in that direction, it will take some years, but uh, the potential is important. And it is not just, of course, about education and environment, about assisting, supporting people and host communities where they are. It is also doing other things that are very important. For example, we are telling rich countries that besides the money that we ask them to put into poorer countries, they should also give some sign of solidarity with these countries. If in Lebanon one person in four is a refugee, shouldn't the rich country altogether try to offer some of those refugees to move uh, to, to their territories, we call this program resettlement. Now, we know that resettlement will always be small. Germany has a resettlement program of about 10,000 people, I think, for the two current years. So it's relatively small compared to the big figures, but it is very useful, one, because it, uh, it can help very vulnerable refugees that may be in distress even in the, ref in the country which is hosting them for a variety of reasons. And also it is an important si signal of solidarity to those countries hosting so many refugees. So in that respect, resettlement is important. It remains a solution for few, but it is an important signal. And more than anything else, it is a signal of international cooperation and solidarity, which is the direction in which we want to push in our narrative of uh, the, the possible. Uh, there's a lot of other things to say, but I want to conclude with just a few reflections since my half an hour is coming to an end, or even gone beyond the end. Um, just to say, uh, to share a few thoughts about um, yourselves as well. Uh, I said that the compact, the notion of the compact that I am proposing, that we are proposing to the international community as the possible response to this very complicated problem of forced displacement, I, am, uh, I said that this type of response should not be only governments and international organizations, should really involve different forces, energies, and resources. And I think that civil society everywhere has a very important role to play. And when I say civil society, I mean civil society everywhere. I, 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 this morning at the education conference, I, I gave an exam, a couple of examples that I think are very interesting. When the Rohingya uh, people came, 
coming from Myanmar, uh, went into Bangladesh uh, two years ago, in less than two years, a year and a half ago, in large numbers, hundreds of thousands. The international response took a while, as is often the case, to reach the people in need. I remember visiting there in the very few days of this big arrival. You know who was providing assistance? It was the local communities. It was the local communities bringing on their cars, on their little trucks, blankets and medicines and food. And I have seen this so many times in the villages in Africa, where people say, look, it's very bad that we have this big influx of refugees, but can we deny our brothers and sisters from across the border the basic help that they need to survive? And, you know, I visited just a few months ago several countries in South America. The solidarity for the Venezuelans who arrived by the millions has been astonishing. But, first of all, we should not take this for granted. This is why we need to provide more substantive assistance to relieve the pressure, but we should take some example from these often very poor communities that share the little that they have. And we should reinstate also here in Europe, in the rich world, a sense of solidarity for those that are in distress. And there's a lot that you can do. You know, there's a lot that you can do. I know that this university receives and takes on board refugee, refugee students. You have actually been quite a leader in this area, and I would encourage you to continue. There is a lot that you can do in the academic field to develop uh, sound thinking, as I said, evidence-based thinking, rigorous thinking about refugees and uh, refugee and migration matters on which so much, uh, so much uh, superficial information is uh, utilized. Uh, there is a lot that you can do, you as students, to help by, you know, volunteering in a country like Germany that is not just a big donor country, but also a country that is hosting so many refugees. There is a lot that you can do to help refugees learn the German language. Learning the language is the first step towards integration, as everybody knows, and uh, this is something that I've seen many students do quite effectively. There's a lot that you can do to provide you German students or students from more stable situations to provide support, peer-to-peer -peer support to refugees coming uh, next to you. And of course, you know, jumping from the individual to the global in creating public awareness around this issue. So the role that a university, the role that the students of a university can have in helping with this response is uh, is quite, uh, is quite extraordinary. And uh, like uh, I know, many student communities in Europe are doing around the issue of climate. I think that very few, very few other communities in the world have developed such a sense of urgency related to the climate emergency that we're all living through as the uh, student communities. And uh, that's, I would like to invite you, continue to do it. Do it also around the complex phenomenon of forced migration, of forced population movement. To, to maintain that, uh, uh, that awareness through good information, through engagement, through being outspoken is very, very, uh, is very, very important, especially around an issue that is so often politicized. You know, if we, uh, if we are to succeed in this response, if we have to turn around this narrative of impossibility which leads to rejection, uh, we need to both find concrete solutions, and we're working on that, as I have tried to explain, but at the same time, we have to continue to uphold values that today are very much, are very much threatened. And if young people, like you cannot do that. I cannot think of anybody else that can help us respond effectively to this crisis. Thank you very much.
Hello, thank you very much for your speech. That was really inspiring. My name is Dr. Corina Cromer. I'm working on human rights and refugee law here at the university. And my question is on what you call the inability to resolve a crisis. Um, as we all know, we see a humanitarian crisis right now in the Mediterranean Sea, not only by the criminalization of refugees, but also by the criminalization of humanitarian assistance. And my question to you would be, first of all, what do you think can be done in regard to this trend? Is it only the mere change of a narrative? And the second question would be, do you support the human rights attorneys who just filed a request with the ICC um, against the European Union with crimes against humanity? Thanks a lot. Do you want me to respond yes, one by okay. one? Yes. Ah, okay, that's easier. Then. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, I won't express my... Can you hear me? Yes, not so. I, I won't express myself so much on the, on the court issue because this is really not my job. This is a job for lawyers to decide whether this is a legitimate uh, reference to a, a tribunal, to a court or not. Um, my job is to continue to remind Europe and any state, in fact, of their obligations, which is that if people seek asylum in once in a, in a particular country, they should be given access to the facilities that are existing in that country to seek asylum. So to prevent that from happening is a violation of refugee law, that's for sure. That's what I'd like to say. But the first part of the question is really what addresses us most directly. You see, there is also, we have to be careful, and I apologize if I always go you know, provide complex answers to simple questions. But these are not simple issues. These are very complex issues. I always invite people to think of these movements, including those across the Mediterranean, as a very long journey or a very long uh, trajectory, let's put it that way, that starts from where, say, for the sake of example, the conflict is and ends up where integration is necessary in a town in Germany. So you need to address, we need to address this phenomenon, this trajectory at every step. That's the only solution. To uh, simply solve one problem of all will not solve the problem altogether. So you need to, we really need to continue to push, to invest more energy, one, solve the root causes. This is very fundamental. But we know that this is a long-term piece of work because the root causes is the peace effort that I spoke about in the beginning, which we are failing, the, the making peace. But it is also very much parallel to addressing issue of poverty, of inequality, to address the consequences of climate change. These are all factors, including epidemics today, that are pushing people to move. So all these things have to address. Now, assuming that that will take time, meanwhile, because people are moving, first of all, we need to help countries that are hosting the largest numbers of people. That's not the rich countries, I said it. This is the poor countries. And this is the type of response that the compact is focusing on, this broader developmental response. Then we need, because these flows are longer and longer, we need to help all the countries that are on, on the transit. Uh, you know, we always think of Libya, but there's many countries before Libya, before you reach the origin. Countries in the Sahel, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they also need ways to manage this flow of people, and the people going through these countries also need help. Then there is the issue of Libya in this particular case. Libya is a mess because Libya is a conflict in itself, so it requires that peacemaking before it requires anything else. Otherwise, any other solution will be difficult. And then there is the issue of what to do with people crossing the sea and coming to Europe. This, which, no matter how many measures will be put in place to avoid it, will continue that phenomenon for a variety of reasons. And there I think that we have to be very clear. First, it's absolutely um, against any principle and any value of Europe, just to stay in Europe, to diminish our capacity to rescue people at sea. And unfortunately, that capacity has been diminished in recent years. And this is very wrong. And this contradicts the most fundamental principles of the law of the sea. It's not even refugee law or humanitarian law. It's the basic law of the sea. Anybody in distress, whoever this person is, needs to be rescued. And we are 
we are diminishing that capacity to do it. So that needs to be restored, and we have appealed very strongly about it. But then, you know, because people will continue to arrive, what Europe needs is a predictable system of disembarkation. If not every country will receive everybody, at least the country is willing to do this. Can they agree to a system of, you know, that we will take that many and we will take that many? You know, what is happening now is that they're, as I said, they're, they're fighting over each boat. So they all agree that there has to be a predictable system, but somehow that agreement never comes because they are all afraid that if they concede anything, the use of a port or, you know, I will take a, a, a thousand people this year, then you will have some politicians in their capital saying, you're giving away our country to the foreigners and they will lose the next elections. This is what is happening. So we need to really move to a collaborative system. We have made, we, refugee and migration organizations, including in the UN, have made very concrete proposals on how to do that. It's not, it's not rocket science, frankly speaking. It is feasible, it requires some resources, probably more than are put in now, and some political will, which is unfortunately rather scarce. Thank you. Yes, please. I'll put that into the question. Uh, thank you very much for according me this chance. Um, I would like to thank you. Uh, Could you tell us please your name and yeah. are you a student? Yeah, my name is Frank Katebe. I'm from Zambia. I'm a student with the University of Liverpool. I'm an online student, but thanks to the free university, I'm using their library here. Um, <laughs> yeah. International uh, I, I think, Yeah, I think you've answered some of the questions that I would have loved to, uh, you to, 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 uh, to answer. But um, a refugee crisis or crisis in, in solidarity. Um, most of the things that you've said are... <clears throat> Uh, are very true, but I would like to say that uh, we, we have a problem. Uh, for instance, this morning we heard that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, is sending 1,000 troops to, um, uh, uh, to Iran. We have a problem in... in I, to, no, I don't know if to Iran, but to the region. Yes, to the region, yes. Yes, to the region, yes. Sorry. Yes. But I use, yeah, yeah. But we, Important. We, we, we've seen the crisis in, in Sudan the past few weeks. No one is reacting. No troops are being sent there, no one. But in the, in, the, in the next few days, we are going to have refugees coming from there. You are doing a very good job as the UNHCR, but if the job that you are doing is being undermined by the rich countries, then I don't know if we are going to make a, 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 any progress. We've seen that the biggest problems that we've had with refugees has been uh, the slow response from the big countries, from the rich countries. We saw the problem in, in, in Rwanda, in Somalia, in, in Libya. In Libya, where you saw every, it was uh, on TV every evening, every morning. And the question is? Yes, the question <laughs> is, uh, sorry, I'm taking yes. too long. Yes, Many yeah. people would like to ask that. Story. Yes, the question is, do you think uh, uh, the, the, the UN uh, Secretariat is doing enough to make sure that uh, these problems are being sorted out. Because while you are doing something, but the UN Secretariat maybe should, should have been going in, maybe probably with the African Union, to prevent this crisis before they even start coming here. Uh, thank you. The good thing you asked and, and answered the kind of the question. Yes, <laughs> we, we hear now his opinion. Yes, yes. It, it is also to, to you journalists. When this crisis okay. uh, stops, ah, good, you, good. Yes, <laughs> you, stop, you stop reporting about them. You, about what? About, about the crisis. When they are bombing Libya, you are reporting every day. When people are dying afterwards, when there is crisis, no one is going there to, to report. That is also a big problem. I'll take, I'll take this critics, please. Uh, well, you know, you said something that I, some of the things you said, you, you, these are very different things, by the way, you know, to send troops to the Middle East because there is a tension between US and Iran, I can say this because everybody knows that, uh, is not the same as not sending the troops to Sudan, which I'm not so sure would be the right solution at the moment to solve the crisis there. So it's, uh, these, you know, again, I would like to appeal to everybody, even people who are upset, like you are, obviously, about the lack of solutions, about um, the, you know, lack of response, 
Let's be very rigorous in how we analyze it. Let's not have generic views that everything is wrong or everything should be done in a certain way. My message here today, because you are an academic institution, is a message of complexity also. These are complex issues that require different types of intervention. The crisis in the Middle East is a very complicated crisis, and you are quite right to raise it because, of course, the tensions in the Middle East between Iran and the Arab world and other tensions have a consequence. You know, they have provoked conflicts, and these conflicts have provoked displacement, and it has been more difficult to address this because of the same tensions. So it's a vicious circle. You're quite right. Now, Sudan is a different story. In Sudan, there's been a movement to ask for freedom, in a way, and there is still an unresolved tug of war be 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 between the old uh, 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 governing class or governing people that are hesitating to leave space to democracy, to freedom, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a, very, different, uh, it's a very different situation that also may benefit from prudent international intervention to support this drive to freedom. And this is what some states actually, like Ethiopia, are trying to do. So, you know, it's a more nuanced picture. But in general, you're quite right that uh, not only, like I said earlier, there is little political solution to conflicts, very insufficient because the countries that can have an influence fight with each other instead of concentrating their effort together in making peace. But there is sometimes even an active intervention on the side of one faction or the other in this bloody internal conflicts that make them worse. It's the case of Libya. It's, it has been the case of Syria for many years. We are quite used as a humanitarian organization to try to intervene even in this very contradictory international politics. But I think that what I take from your question, from your general statement that you made, is that yes, our appeal is to the countries that have political influence to abandon this meddling and these tensions and to try to concentrate forces towards solving a problem. Because in the long run, in the long run, solving the problem is also in the political and economic interest of those same countries. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your insightful and comprehensive talk. My name is Lina Al Haddad. I am a psychologist. I come from Syria and I'm a PhD researcher at FU. So I would like to ask you about the relationship the UNHCR has as an independent entity that helps people in need with governments that might be, that are using the, getting the money from UNHCR to help people in need in neighboring countries. I come from Syria, so I talk about Jordan and Lebanon. And in cases of governments that might be corrupt or there are um, certain uh, claims of corruption, what, how does the UNHCR hold these governments uh, accountable when certain claims like that happen? You know, um, humanitarian work, like we do, and human rights work are, have a lot of points in common, but are different. Human rights work, human rights organizations, including my, the other high commission, you know, there's two high commissioners in the UN. One is for human rights, one is for refugees. The responsibility of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is to hold the countries accountable to their practices in respect of human rights and call on them when they violate rules, etc., etc. Her job is very difficult. I don't envy my fellow High Commissioner, Madame Bachelet. But our job is a little bit, is considerably different. We do have some rights based element of our job, we have to remain vigilant as the custodians of the Refugee Convention that states, in particular those that have signed the convention, but many others that have signed other conventions or follow other practices, that states observe the fundamental rules in terms of how refugees and displaced are treated. There, I think, you know, if a state abuses or a state does something wrong, I have the right we do it in different ways, sometimes publicly, sometimes privately, to say this state is violating. You know, you should not do it in this way, you should do it in the proper way. So there we have a, 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 a legal role you know, that we can exercise. All the rest, 
older, in all the rest, we have to adapt to the situations on the ground, which are very complex. Sometimes refugees and even more so displaced people live in an area that are not even under the government, that are controlled by armed gangs like in Central America. I have visited parts of Central America where to go and visit the displaced people, I had to ask permission from criminal gangs. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Did I do something wrong? because I had to deal and recognize them as the local authority? Should I have avoided negotiating with them? Then I would not have been able to go and hear the stories of the displaced people. Likewise, the use of resources, because that's, you know, everything is linked together. Of course, resources are misused very often by whoever controls the situation, sometimes government, sometimes others. And of course, it is completely our responsibility, especially as an organization that uses resources that are given by taxpayers, by citizens in other countries, it is our responsibility to ensure that there is no abuse. But it is very difficult. I'm not suggesting that, okay, because it's difficult, we close one eye and no. But we have to realize that sometimes there is dissatisfaction in public opinion. Oh, because, you know, you're dealing with bad governments, you're dealing with bad people. Well, unfortunately, I have to deal with them. Now, I can assure you that we do everything possible. We have put in place a lot of systems to try and ensure the integrity of the resources that we use. I do everything possible to try and avoid that any compromise is made with bad people that may put you know, in jeopardy the integrity of my organization from the principal point of view, from the resource point of view. But I think that everybody has to understand that because we are left alone in the front line of conflicts, us, the Red Cross and other organizations, we are the one who get, you know, who are at the bad end of the game. This is where hands get very dirty. So we put all the gloves in the world, but in the end, the dirt is deep. Thank you. At FU as well. Um, and thank you for your insightful talk. Um, my question was, because in your, in your talk, you demarcated very clearly between an economic refugee and a refugee um, fleeing from causes of uh, wars or any severe co um, results. Um, however, I think from the time the refugee term has emanated back in the days, as you said, the Iron Curtain, etc., cetera, um, are we not now in a, in, a different, in a different world or faced by different challenges and as you said gang crimes are very em evident and uh, even climate ch uh, causes etc so is the term refugee as the UNHCR is using it not exhaustive enough and why is there so much resistance uh, in the international community to actually make this term a bit more inclusive I would say uh, no I think that the, the term is still valid you see uh, I, I tried to explain it in the beginning, but let me explain it again a bit more clearly, perhaps. If the fundamental notions of what makes a refugee are that you are, you know, there is a war, you're, you're at risk of your life, or you're persecuted, or you are discriminated against for different reasons, and that this situation happens in a context in which your government your state cannot offer you the protection that states have to offer to people that are in danger, right? Then uh, that definition can, you know, which was really conceived around a certain context in Europe in 1951 or in the 40s, let's say, this definition can be expanded to many others that we call refugees now and that flee different contexts from those of 1951. You see what I mean? So that definition can be uh, applied to broader categories of people. Uh, however, and so, you know, I am all in favor of trying to adapt and try to cover as much as possible people in need of that type of protection. International protection, because national protection is impossible, doesn't happen. Sometimes it's the state itself that is the persecuting agent. But uh, uh, I would be careful in expanding it too much to everybody who needs to move. Because there are many people who need to move, who need to move. I'm not arguing at all that these people are less 
uh, th th their needs are less important than those of refugees, but they're different. They have not lost the protection of their state. You can say, okay, their state maybe is not managing the country very well, but this happens in many, many states. That's not in itself a reason to define somebody as a refugee. But there may be poverty or other social problems in a certain country, and people move to seek better opportunities where there is more prosperity and more stability. Sure, are these people refugees? Well, they may have some reasons, you know, sometimes it's a bit mixed, but there are people that do not correspond to that notion of refugees that I have described. And I think that it would be imprudent, imprudent, not cautious, to enlarge the definition of refugee too much. I think those people that I would define migrants, words are words, you can argue, that I would define migrants, need their own set of rules and procedures and channels and protections themselves, but they are different. They are different. That's why there are two compacts. That compact is looking exactly at that aspect of population movements in recognition that they are not the same. And there is a very practical reason. I want to say it again. If, if we expand much further, if we call, for example, everybody that is moving because of climate change a refugee, then the risk is that states will say, okay, then we have to rediscuss the definition of refugee. Let me tell you, and here I am being very opportunistic, if we do that in today's world, in the present climate, we lose it. We lose everything. We lose also the space that the traditional definition has. It's very dangerous to put it on the table today because states will take, many states will take that opportunity to restrict even further instead of expanding. I'm absolutely sure. I've followed the debate on the compact. So that's why we have been, sometimes people are rolling their eyes when we defend the convention, we say the convention is still valid. The convention is still valid because you can stretch to a certain extent its application, stretch in a legitimate way to people in need that lose national protection. But if you stretch too much, it breaks and that's different, different and difficult. Take from this side, yes please. Very shortly, just sure. others could ask, please. Um, it actually goes very much along the answer you just provided to the previous question. My name is Sheila Roman. I have the privilege to be teaching here at this university for this semester. I'm from Italy, same country. So um, my question will go a little bit into this direction of the compact on migration. I know you said before it's not the one you want to talk about, but yet I'm, I'm very curious because it's a more complicated one. So I would be interested in knowing where you see it, that it is currently stuck and why, and what you actually see is the way forward with that compact in particular. Thank you. I, I, you know, I, I am not really involved in detail in the migration compact, but it is clearly stuck because many countries have, um, you see, still I think that it is a bit difficult even for the most uh, anti-migration country countries to say that refugees should not be protected. I mean, you know, it happens, it happens, but it is not that easy. But it is easier to focus on migration in that sense, to say, you know, why do we want to regulate migration? We just have to have as little as possible. That's, you know, the very simplistic uh, discourse that is done by certain countries, whilst Everybody knows that migration is needed, and everybody knows that because of the lack of a regulated, uh, of a governance of the migration system, what prevails is the abuse of those migrants that make it. But this is maybe part of the problem, because if you abuse, you pay less, you exploit. Instead, if there was a more regulated framework, uh, the cost would be higher, but also the rights of the people would be better respected. But I don't want to go into that because it's not really my world. I would really say that it's a political obstacles that prevents more countries to support what is a very important process in this whole exercise. Actually, I had a lot of questions too. <laughs> Ask one. So my job was so light today. Uh, so we take the last two from the audience, and one here, and please, and are really the last ones. And then we go and enjoy the sun, it's also nice. So. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, she'll go first and then we go to you. My question is, what is the approach of your agency towards countries like Hungary, where you have a regional office, but whose government has run a very successful uh, campaign um, demonizing migrants, has built walls, 
and has chastised my own university for helping migrants and is essentially forcing us out. I can only say that we have disagreed privately and publicly with these policies. Many times we're on record on that, very much on record. And we think that it is, these are not bad per se, this not only violates certain principles, but it constitutes a very negative element in the effort that we should all make to have a European policy. So it is really an obstacle, not only to international cooperation, Hungary, by the way, has not subscribed to the refugee compact, not only to international cooperation, but also to um, European cooperation, which is so important for all of us. Now, I can fully understand that countries that have entered the European Union later may need longer and more complex periods of adjustment to align their practices to that of Europe, but I think that uh, at least we need to see efforts in that direction rather than the opposite, which is what we have seen in the last few years. Uh, well, thank you. I'm uh, Radwa from uh, uh, American University in Cairo. I want to ask about the s sustainability of the financial resources of the institution with this in increasing number of migrants and refugees. And you told us that almost 4 billion uh, euros are spent this year. So should we expect that donor countries may eliminate this, uh, this money to the refugees? Should we think about how, uh, um, the economic role migrants do or refugees do in, in the countries they are working instead of, of considering them as a burden? Um, yeah, I, I want to know more about the sustainability of these resources because unfortunately this number of migrants are increasing and I, am, I fear that maybe one day the resources are not efficient enough to cover them. Thank you. I, can I? Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, the humanitarian money that is spent by the world every year, I think if I'm not mistaken, last year was between 20 and 25 billion dollars. I'm not just speaking about UNHCR, I'm speaking about all the humanitarian effort. And that, of course, is for refugees, but also for many other humanitarian situations, famine, uh, uh, epidemics, and so forth. So 20 to 25 million dollars. Is that enough? I don't think it is quite enough. But one thing that I can say is that it has not only been relatively stable, that money, but it has increased over the years. So there is often a perception that humanitarian funding is going down. No, humanitarian funding is actually going up. Even for UNHCR, humanitarian funding, not dramatically, but it has gone up every year. Not as much as the needy people, but it has gone up. My point is more the point, the point I want to make is the more the point that I made earlier, that this type of money is good, is, is useful for the short term, for the immediate needs. It's not, it, I don't know if the money is sustainable or not, but what it targets is not sustainability. It's just the immediate survival and response, which is very important. Sorry, don't get me wrong. That money we need and we need more if possible. But what we really need is different type of resources. I have described what through the compact we are trying to do. In countries like Zambia, for example, this is one of the 15 countries where we do have this new model, where we have the World Bank, big bilateral development organizations, some big foundations like the Gates Foundation or the you know, foundation of big companies that come in with longer term money, with different approaches that are much more sustainable, that aim at making people in need self-reliant, included, and aim at giving people in need not only dignity, but also the ability of staying without aid, which is always what happens with humanitarian assistance after one or two years. So that's where we need to really work, that parallel effort, and it is the combination of short-term and long-term that will make this sustainable. Thank you so much today for your speech and for answering all the possible questions. Thank you for the FU hosting us here, and uh, thank you for being with us today on this sunny day, and still uh, sitting till the end and asking. Thank you so much. Uh, can we do a picture together with them? Here. Yes. Selfie. I would like to do a picture with all of you if you join us. Vice President, if you could join us too.
So, yes. are you ready? Oh, this, okay. is oh, this is fantastic. This is fantastic. Yes. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Jeff. I had an easy job today.